Sorry. Ta-da. <laughs> <laughs> with the real life Do you know what? There was, a, there was a bit of a mismatch there, wasn't there, people? There was some great singing, but you lot look like miserable sods. Okay, now, it's my job to bring you God's life-giving word so that you can connect what you sort of know to be true, but it might actually light you up a little bit. Are you ready for that? I'm not messing. Are you ready for that? Because if you don't come with expectation, then you're going to miss a trick, people. Bow your heads. Lord, we need some clarity today. Some of us need some comfort today. Some of us in challenge today. More than anything, we need grace today. We pray to you that your word speaks powerfully into every human heart that is humble and willing to receive. So, Lord, get past our stubbornness, move through the grime that is within us, and would you show us Christ? For we need him today, Lord. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. I'm so glad of this passage of scripture today. We're going to find out that it's very easy. So the preacher's dream, you're ready to go. Those of you who are taking notes, get ready to write and write fast because everybody will repeat it back. So you've got two goes at it. Are we ready? Strength for the struggles to stand. Is that one? Strength for the struggles to stand. Well, really, it should be strength through the struggles to stand. But if you're really confused, let me help you with the wonderful wit, wisdom, and spiritual clarity of a Disney movie. Anybody seen The Lion King? Yes, you have. Now, I need you to tell me the three characters that the story revolves around. And if anybody says to Bo and Pumbaa, I'm going to smack in the bush. <laughs> okay, who are the three characters that the story of the Lion King revolve around? Give me one of them. Simba. Shut up, you're going to point to you. Okay, give me another one. Scar. Okay, Simba, Scar. And Rachel's like, oh, 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 Bet Sue doesn't know the last one, do you? No. Can't have a go. You're right, who is the Lion King? The Big Daddy Lion King. Mufasa. Mufasa. And the whole of the story is basically about will one who is the son of the king get to enjoy all the blessings of the king? And who's the enemy? And I want you to watch this, people, because you could easily miss it. Scar wants rid of Simba. Does he go to the gun covers, load up, locked and loaded, and just go... He's much more subtle than that, isn't he? I want you to see how bad Scar comes at Simba. In fact, I don't, I don't need to tell you, you already know. What is Scar's tactic? What is his scheme? What is his strategy for getting his evil way? What does he do? You're going to be like a literary commentator when you're older, aren't you? So he gets rid of, tries to get rid of the king, but what's he do with Simba? What does he do with Simba? Think about it. He tracks him down and then stabs him in the eye. Is that what he does? What's he do? He puts it, yeah, 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 but what's his way of getting rid of him? Really interesting, that, isn't it? You see, the way Scar comes at Simba is not a full frontal attack. No, what it does is he says, Go over there, go to a place where you shouldn't be, go there and find life, go and live in that place. And of course, the moment that Simba goes, he's still whispering. And what is he whispering? You're not worthy. Nobody loves you. You should run and hide. You can't be worthy of being the king. Did you notice what his strategy was? Was it a gun? It was rise and deceit and twist. 
And I said to you as I start, you, you get some wonderful spiritual realities here. Because the Bible, and this book of Ephesians, has been telling us some amazing news. We've been hearing of the glorious, wonderful work of God in Christ to make people his children and to grant to them a glorious inheritance. But there is one who has to get them. There is one who won't come at them with an AR-15, a Glock 9mm, or even a spatula. He'll come at them with lies and deceit because he hates them. <laughs> Does the bad guy come straight at you? Oh no. And as I'm telling you, you're like, why are you telling us, Steve? Telling us to scare us? No, I'm not doing that. I'm telling you this because you know this. Anybody who has walked a few miles in the Christian life knows that it's so much harder than it feels like it should be. You think, hold on, I've trusted Jesus. He is my Lord and King. He has brought me into his kingdom. He has given me the free gift of salvation and forgiveness through what he has done. He's made me alive in him. I'm alive to God. He's woken me from a spiritual death that was brought upon me by believing the lies of the enemy. I'm not duped by that anymore. I'm living for Jesus. Two minutes later, this is so hard. There are so many temptations. There are so many lies out there that just seem to wrap themselves around my heart. Is Jesus really the king? Am I really safe? Could he really love somebody like me? And Scar, no, not Scar, somebody else who will find out in a minute. He's whispering lies at us. We are constantly being encouraged to go to places that we're not supposed to go and believe things that we're not supposed to believe, all so that we can be left out where? In the spiritual wilderness. You see, the enemy of our soul doesn't need to turn you into a demon to get you off the playing field. He just needs to leave you in the wilderness. Who am I talking to today? Anybody ever felt like they've been in that spiritual wilderness and wondered whether there is ever any way back at all? And he's come with his accusations and he said, you can never be loved. Jesus isn't real. His kingdom is not that important. And you should just go and live in the place and do whatever you jolly well want to do because there is freedom. Is this the challenge of the Christian life? Of course it is. Do you live like this sometimes? In low grade guilt. Oh, you come to church and you sang, It is well with my soul, but you didn't sing, It is well with my soul. You sang, It is well with my soul. I'm lying to you people. I'm not preaching to somebody today. And every time you sing a song like that, like this. You've lived in low grade guilt, you're disillusioned, since you've blocked off from seeing the beauty of Jesus. Listen, this book is all about the glories of God in Christ, how he comes to get you, how he gives you what you cannot earn, how your future is secured, not on the basis of what you bring to the table, because all you bring to the table is mess, but on the basis of who he is. His love is not earned, it is a gift, it's not that it's achieved, but it's received. It is well with my soul, so why does it not feel well with my soul? Because you are in a battle. And in fact, the place we've got to in this book of Ephesians, well, we've seen it, haven't we? In the first part of the book, we saw the doctrines and the wonderful truths about God. Then we saw the duties, what it looks like to live out of those as our new identity in Jesus. And if we've done the doctrines and we've done, if you like, the duties, now in this last section, he says, you see it in chapter in verse 6, finally, he's now going to talk about the difficulties. Oh, it's so honest. Let me run that one by you again, okay? What we've had, we've had something of the wealth of what we have in Jesus Christ. Then we've got, listen, this is what it looks like to walk in it, and now, if you like, we've got the warfare of it. Anybody ever woken up thinking, am I really in this battlefield? Is it supposed to be this hard? Let me run that one by you again, if you like. What we've got is how we are seated in Jesus Christ. More secure than you could possibly imagine. We're seated. And then what we do is we will walk in faith. But now he's going to show us how to stand. 
We are seated, we are walking, we are standing up. Is this something your soul needs today? Give me a nod if you agree. Of course it is. So the honesty here is that if you want to pursue intimacy with the living God, enjoy all the graces of Jesus Christ that are on offer to you, a treasure more than you can possibly imagine, enjoying intimacy with the Lord, its context is adversity. Because there is somebody who wants to destroy the purposes of God and will stop at nothing. So let's have a little look at this one. This is very easy. I gave you three S's earlier. Earlier, what was the first one? Or what was the first one, people? Strength. Strength. Are we ready to see some strength? Here we go. Verse ten. Finally, be what in the Lord? Strong. Anybody feeling strong today? Some of you are still foolish enough to make New Year's resolutions. Do you know what the New Year's resolution is? It is an aspiration to strength in some domain of your life. And usually, how long do our New Year's resolution plans, people? Two weeks is very optimistic. Mine seems to, but it's an aspiration to be strong. Maybe you've decided you're going to be able to do X number of reps at the gym. I will be strong in my reps. Maybe you've determined that you will finally get round to changing the bed once a week. I will be strong in my housekeeping. And I'll be talking at the moment. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Maybe you've resolved to sort out some excuse me. Illness. No, some area of your finances. I will be able to take my missus out for a swanky meal by the back end of the gym. Whatever it is, it is an aspiration to strength. And I want to tell you, don't you dare make a resolution. Because every resolution a resolution to be strong will make you weaker. The Ephesian church was surrounded by a city of strength. It had commerce, it had culture, and it had massive spiritual ideology being forced upon it. You were expected to be worship this and do that and follow this idea. And if you did, the payback would be strength. And all of them are sitting there going, Whoa, I'm so strong, amazing. I'll be somebody if I can do this. They would be encouraged to be strong in their appearance, strong in their achievements, strong in their finances, strong in their reputation. And Paul looks at them and says, don't you dare chase yourself down that rabbit hole because it will eat you alive because there is only one source of strength in the world and his name is the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. And I don't like that translation. I like the authorised version because it be, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Let's say it together. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. It doesn't get say get strength from the Lord. Now that's what some of you want, isn't it? I want to run my life this way. I want to speak to the Lord. And what I want him to do is give me strength in order that I can achieve and do what I want to do. He isn't the sky fairy who sprinkles fairy dust over you to give you what you want. It is impossible to get strength from the Lord unless you are in the Lord. Let me tell you a story. When we lived in Philly for a little while, there was a men's group that would meet religiously every Saturday morning at 6.30. You'd got guys who were accountants, guys who were lecturers, guys who were tradesmen. They'd turn up in their big, massive trucks that have their coffees that were at least a gallon deep. And they would turn in and they would dig into the Bible and they would encourage one another's heart to stand firm to Jesus. The group was originally started because of addiction issues um, and all kind of promiscuity. And these guys realised that they were in a battle and they needed to get with other guys and get in together to strengthen one another in the battle. I remember sitting in my first group and there was this tiny little man who was a lecturer in history or something. He was really absolutely tiny, but he was a warrior. We were sitting in our group. He'd say, right, you, tell me your best, tell me your worst. And he'd be like, oh, oh what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? And there was this poor guy who'd go for a long, long time, and he just looks at him and he goes, well? And the guy comes out with, well, I wasn't here last week because this happened, and she got angry with me, and that didn't work, and felt pretty low, and had a hard time. And he's like, yeah, shh, shh, shh. 
Let me tell you what happens on the African plains, he said. This is what happens on the African plains. The leopards and the cheetahs are after the herd of gazelles. And they wait in the bushes. And they wait until one little gazelle is away from the herd. And when that poor little gazelle that thinks it's all strong by itself is away in the thicket, BAM! The leopard pounces. The only way that you stay strong if you're a gazelle is if you're in a herd. You don't get strength from the herd unless you are in the herd. Are you a gazelle? Listen, the Lord doesn't download strength on, on you when you're away from him. Your strength is when you're right in the middle of him. And Christ is the one who puts us right in the middle of him. The gospel message is that when we were without strength, when we could not fix our sins, when we were enemies of the living God, when we had no claim on heaven, when we were clueless and casting our worship onto anything and anybody, he came for us. He came and died for the ungodly and made us his own children. You are not strong if you are not in the Lord. Can I ask you a quick question? Who in the last five minutes has changed their New Year's resolution? Have you? If you haven't, you're full. This is your New Year's resolution. I'm going to be in the Lord. I'm going to be in the Lord. I'm going to be in the Lord. But the assumption here is, and please get this, this is available to you, but it's not automatic. So that you can be in a state of your life, and many of us can testify to this, we know what this experience is, is that you can know that you are loved. You can know that you are blessed. You can know that the love of Jesus Christ is the most precious thing in all the world. You can know that you have a calling on your life and a purpose to serve him and his kingdom, but be weak. Because you are looking for strength in all the wrong places. I'm not speaking to anybody today. The thing that will make you the weakest, the quickest, is looking for strength in the wrong place. I want to be this. This is how I will feel alive. This is what will make me feel acceptable. And Christ comes along and says, I've done it for you. I have power and might that has been exercised for my glory and your good. Live out of that. Be strong in the Lord. Does that sound good to you? Out there is a world desperate for strength. And here we have one who is powerful and he's with us now. There is power in here. We've only got half the church here today. And I wish I could download it to them. But the power is the Lord and the presence of his people with the gospel open and us leaning into him. I said there were three S's. The first one was strength through the... You want to see the struggles? The word in there is in struggles. What? Well, have a little look at the next couple of verses and tell me where I get the word struggle from. Go on, tell me. Tell me why. A struggle. In other versions it says... We wrestle. Now you will like this, Lucas. This word, come on, get over here, lad. And look me. You want to know what a struggle is, what the literal translation of that word is? Come here. Water combat. In other words, it's personal. How did that feel, Lucas? 
bad. <laughs> the Bible tells us that there is somebody who wants to get up close and personal and rip us to pieces right in our face. We have one who has schemes. He is called the devil or Satan and he lies. He loves himself, he hates the living God, and he hates the idea of anybody trusting and relying on Jesus Christ. He wants the world to forget about Jesus, live for themselves. You don't have to turn around and say, I worship Satan for him to be happy. You have to just turn around and say, I will prioritise and build my hope and aspiration for this life and the next on anything other than Jesus. He is like, and has his powers and his gang, which are like a cosmic mafia, an evil racket, and their one goal is to distract you and me, up close and personal, from Jesus. And can I warn you, the Bible takes this very seriously, because he is the best pastor the world has ever had. He's been at it for more than 6,000 years, and he knows what to say. He uses lies like Scar did to get you to think about anything other than Jesus. He's a master of media manipulation. He knows how to do an advertisement campaign. He knows where your soft spots are, and he will attack your thoughts to capture your heart, to change and shift your allegiance. And you and me, he's not like a real devil here, He's big. You cannot survive his onslaught. There is only one who is big. You need to believe in him. You cannot be strong in yourself. Satan is a very successful creature. He will build fake confidence, usually in yourself and your own supposed wisdom. Other people will gently question, why are you doing that? But because you've listened to Satan, because you've heard his whispers, and he knows what buttons to push, you will be hook, line, and sinker, and march into disaster and fire, thinking yourself clever. Anybody ever found themselves there? Look back when they've been ensnared, go, how the monkeys did I get there? Tell me when it first started. Lies. Lies and temptation. Can I tell you, he is the kind of pastor and preacher who doesn't ever take a sabbatical. He never has a Sunday off. He doesn't just preach at you on a Sunday. He does it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday as well. And then you wake up with it every morning sitting on your phone. He uses means and ideologies and people. He convinces you that Jesus is worthless and you are God. And how does that sound to somebody like you and me? Oh, I like that. I'm the answer to all my problems. And so, he will threaten you with things that you scare and tell you that you are scared of and tell you that God is not big enough. He will remind you with arrows of either, he will send you arrows of doubting God's word, or when you have doubted God's word, accusations, arrows of accusations, <coughs> you cannot come back. He's been around for such a long time, he knows what he is doing. And the Apostle Paul is ringing a bell and telling them the truth of what they know already because they live in Sin City. And they are facing this every day. And it makes them feel as if they're the problem. No, no. Our war is not against flesh and blood, but against the powers and the authorities in the heavenly place. This evil, demonic hordes who use means and people to whisper lies. They want to take you out. And Paul wants us to be wise to these demonic wrestlings and schemes. He wants us to be wise to it. When we go on holiday, we go to a water park. And the best thing about the water park is not the water park, but it's the zoo attached to the water park. Anybody been there to the one in Murphy? Dina, in the zoo, the best zoo in the world. So when you walk into the zoo, you first walk past this massive rhino that is standing there just waiting to die, but then you move past and go up the path and you find an old railway carriage, an ancient railway carriage, you know, one of those chapel uh, carriages where there's a big sliding door, it's like wooden panels, and you can imagine either um, goods or cattle were put in there. And behind there is two lions, actually more than two, 
three lions. And you go, why is there a railway carriage and lions? What have they got to do with one another? And so you read the board. And it's all about the account of the town of Sabah in the late 1890s. They were trying to build a railway from one part of Africa to another, and they came to a massive gorge near the town of Sabah. So the British colonialists at the point said, we are going to build a bridge across that chasm. And as they started to gather workers in from all around, several thousand of them gathered to do the work that was supposed to take nine months, they realised something odd was happening. The workers were disappearing. And they were like, oh, maybe they've just gone back to their loved ones, maybe the work was too hard, maybe they didn't like pay. But then there were certain workers who had very committed some of the leadership as well, and they were responsible for it, and they started to just disappear. Gone. Is that somebody coming to pick up the complete punchline of my story? <laughs> it ain't the law, it's turned it off. Brilliant. Fair enough. <laughs> and so as these people were disappearing, there started to be a panic rumbling amongst the, the camp. And that panic was confirmed when two or three days later they discovered a human head lying in the grass. They started to think what could have done this. And one of the leaders again said there was only one thing that could have done this, a man into the line. And so they started to gather the people closer together. But they realised that this man-eating lion was wise. And in fact, there wasn't just one, there were two. What they did, these lions, was they would sneak upon the place where the people were the most vulnerable. It was the place where the people who had escaped the lion attacks had been taken. It was the hospital tent. And in the dark of the night, the lions would sneak in and start dragging away injured people. But these lions were clever at the schemes. They were wild. They just wanted to get what they wanted. And so what they did, the, uh, the camp officials, was that they moved the hospital tent to another location and loaded up the, the tent with old dead goats and dead, um, dead sheep to try to lure the lions in. But the lions were too wily and too skillful. Where did the lions go? Was it the bay hospital tent? No, they found the, the, the newly located one and dragged bodies away. And it wasn't until somebody who was smarter than the lion, somebody who was bigger than the lion, and somebody who had more firepower than the lion, came along to end the carnage. And it was a big hunter. And if you want to watch the film, it's got Val Kilmer in it. It was done in the 90s. And the name of the film is The Ghost and the Darkness. If you want to watch a good movie on New Year's, watch that later. Now we're being told that there is an enemy who when subterfuge and scheming, he is out to get you. Please can I be clear? Spiritual warfare is not you taking on the devil, because he's got too big a fangs. You don't get to fight the devil. It's a competition that is as easy as not me against Lucas, but me against, oh, I don't know, maybe Josh or something. It would not be pretty. And what we do is we live in the victories of the hunter who said, I'm going to destroy the works of the devil. And his name is Jesus. So there we've seen strength through the in order to stand. How many times did it say stand there in those verses? Very quickly, have a quick look. How many times did it say stand? The stand, there's withstand. I'll tell you, four times it's referenced there in that verse. Because the living God wants his beloved people to stand. Not be assaulted, or be assaulted, but to stand. He doesn't, he doesn't airlift you out of the adversity. He parachutes you in and says, I'm going to help you to stand. And the way that you stand is by putting on what? Armour. It's not an armour that is given to you, it's an armour of God that you sit under and are secured by. Our battle is all road ready won. Jesus has beaten the enemy on our, our behalf. All you can do is sit in what he has provided for you. And he wants you 
to stand. And all of these elements of the armour of God are really wrapped up in one big thing. It is the voice of God's salvation and grace to you. He wants you to hear his voice. You see, when your mind is locked onto what he has given you, what's it not listening to? Please, please, please get this. Write this down. Do not believe everything you think. Do not believe everything you think. There are certain things that you think about that start to percolate and bubble around inside you that are not true, but you give them permission and they will take you to bad places. Do you know what I'm talking about? Let me give you an example using these things here that are spoken of in this passage. What we read here is very simple and straightforward. We read verse 13, Therefore put on the full armour of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, verse 14, stand firm then with what? The belt of truth. What is the belt of truth? It's a picture of undergarments that hold everything together. In other words, what is the belt of truth? It is what you're supposed to care about in life. The Lord tells us who you are, where you're from, who he is, and what he is doing. And he says, care about that. But everywhere else, there are other voices trying to get into your thinking. Anybody watch the fireworks on the BBC last night? Even in the fireworks for New Year's Eve, there was propaganda telling you what you should care about. You look at an advert, you look at your phone, you go to the shops, you go to school. Somebody somewhere is telling you what truth to care about. And the Lord says, listen to mine. So yesterday morning, I was a bit confused. I was like, oh, isn't it on another New Year? Oh, dear. And I put on my Bible, the very first chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, again about the creation of the world. And it says, first five words, in the beginning. <gasps> Oh yeah, that's what I'm supposed to care about. That's what my life is about. That's why I'm here and I've got breath in my body. In the beginning, and suddenly the bell of truth had just got me like this. I was like, I don't know what to do today. Do you see what the bell of truth does? You put it on. You know what to care about. What about the next one there? Can you, can you see it? It says, there's a belt of truth. It can tell me what the next thing is. A breastplate of righteousness. Because you will put on a breastplate of some sort of righteousness. Let me tell you what I mean. I've got, I've got it written down on my piece of paper. Give me a second. I've got it in the wrong order. Hold on. Hold on. Not there. I want to be clear on this. Aha! Righteousness is a measure of what it is worth doing, of what is right and wrong. So if you have ever said to yourself, I'm a loser, guess what? Breastplate you just put yourself on. It's a measure of your performance. Give have said, I'm a winner, I'm better than them. You put on a breastplate. But it's not a breastplate of his righteousness. What you've done is you've set a measure of what it means for you to be, what you should aim for, what you should pursue. If you say, I'm a winner, I'm a loser, then all you've done is indulge that sense of, my identity is tied up with what I do, and guess what, I'll decide what it's worth doing. I'll decide the measure. And the Lord comes in with his word, he tells us who he is, and he says, Jesus, I've given you one who shows you what it means to be human, I've given you one who is so strong, got so much right standing and merit, that you can be wrapped up in him as well. And so, if you're wearing that breastplate, you won't be saying, do you know what? I'm a loser. I'm a winner. I'm a waste of space. I'm better than them. You'll be saying, I'm a Jesus. And all of your problems will slowly fade away, because so many of our problems start in our thinking, in our heads. Because we let these little lies in. If I had more time, I'd go through all the rest as well. But what we have here is a declaration of what we have already in Jesus Christ. So therefore, 
Don't believe everything that you think because it is tainted by the enemy's lies. Know the word of God and what he says about you and himself and your purpose and why you're here and what matters in life and live out of that. You will find great relief. But it's more personal than that. We jump to another verse as I finish. In addition, verse 16, hold on, no, verse 18, and pray in the Spirit on how many occasions? All occasions. In other words, this is worked out in the presence of a God who is near, and in the power of the Spirit, we can communicate and relate to him. I have a friend who rings me two, three times a year, and for a while I used to get really annoyed. So I'd start talking to him about things that were going on, and he'd interrupt me with words like this. Let's just offer that up to the Lord. Lord, we'll just bring it to you. And ask. I'm like, hello? I started to dread him ringing me because he was so spiritual in the way that he prayed on all occasions. And then, because I don't like to be beaten, I was like, aha, he's on the phone again. So I'd say, how are you? And he'd start talking about stuff that was going on. And in the middle of the conversation, I'd just start going, Lord, we just offer that up to you. And we know that you're present and real. And that thing that is on my friend's heart, we just commend it to you. And actually, Turning from being insecure and wanting a spiritual domain of my life to be boxed up from all the rest, suddenly I'm like, everything's all about Jesus. That is how you grow. Now I know there's that awkward tension, uncomfortable moment that you have to step over. It's worse than your house, house isn't it? Because you've got into a pattern as to how you live. Here's something to aim at. Because the Lord is present and he wants to be involved in absolutely everything. So much so that I need to tell you that you need to be like my old iPad. My iPad is getting old and I've noticed something. It's the very opposite of Emily's new phone. Christmas afternoon, she'd only had the phone six hours. She was absolutely thrilled. She's like, Daddy, I put it into charge for 17 seconds and it lasted for as long as I've had it this afternoon. And it tells me it'll go on for three and a half weeks no matter how much I use it. It's full of strength and charge. And she likes the idea of that. She likes the idea of being able to disconnect and just do as she pleases and every now and again just pop back in and recharge it. Counter that with my iPad, which is getting old. I've noticed that if I want to use it for more than 10 minutes, what do I have to do? Keep it plugged in. And even then, it starts to go down and go down and go down. And I started to lament and get miserable about like this stupid iPad. How do you, you can't even make an Apple product, you can't even get a new battery in them. I want this thing to be strong on its own. I do not want to have to plug it in. I want it to be on demand and I want it to overcome all the challenges that I set before it. And I suddenly realised I am the iPad. Because I'm a pastor. Man of the word of prayer. But I don't want to have to be plugged in. And then I suddenly realised something when I was preparing this passage. I'm supposed to be like my old iPad. I'm not supposed to go very far in the cause. I'm supposed to be dependent. I'm supposed to speak with him and appropriate, put on, wear that riot gear armour that he has won for me because our God is the mighty warrior. But he just developed another resolution for this coming year. What do you need to do, Curtis? Stay plugged in. Relate to the God who made you and loved you. Lean into his strength. Don't be surprised when you're out of it and the enemy seems to be winning. Trust Jesus Christ as he came for you. And when you are weak, he is Strength through the struggle to. Now we're going to, we usually at this point, everybody get a mental break as we sing a, a worship song about the Lord. But something different is going to happen. There is going to be a pianist and a singer standing up there, but you'll notice that near my feet and slightly in front of me, 